but I'll jump to the conclusions for right now, which are the best process for low pressure drop materials in molds is many different processes work. They don't always have to be exactly decoupled three. Uh, flow front switch over, that is when the flow front arrives at a certain place, either at the end of the cavity or just upstream, works again for low pressure loss parts. Um, decoupled three controls pretty well across a broad spectrum of, um, of different processes. Um, this one's been argued about inside our building for a while. Should I use end of cavity or post gate control? Well, decoupled three works very well for switchover, better than post gate if the sensor is in the area of influence and the machine response is good. If you have a slow responding machine and the flow front gets that end of cavity sensor and begins building up pressure, you tell the machine to transfer and it doesn't, you're just going to overpack the part. It's got to be able to stop. Um, the Arberg pressure regulation again has a couple of warnings. You have there's a stop point. If you don't stop it before the part starts to solidify, you will get an overpack during the cooling phase because it attempts to keep matching that template even though the part can't is frozen. Uh, and there's some other other quirks about it you have to learn. Um, so choosing and setting up the control. My point of all of this that I learned is. The first question out of the box is how thin is the part and what kind of material you're using? Because if you don't know the material and you don't know the part, recommending a control strategy doesn't make any sense. The usual things you see on every slideshow, Bazelli's and everybody else, mold, material, number of cavities, runners, wall thicknesses. And don't forget the wall thickness of the flowing material is missing two skins. That's the way I was looking at it. I mean, you got a 30 thousandths wall part, and I'm pretty sure it's got 10 thousandths of skin, frozen skin, right away as soon as it hits. There's only 10 thousandths column for that material to go down inside that part. So the pressure losses get extraordinary inside that part. Um, and the flow length, of course, pressure loss, flow length are, are equivalent. And then, uh, of course, your material has all kinds of properties about it how much it compresses, whether it shears, so on and so forth. It's part of thinking through the strategy for control. Uh, I, I was, this is one of my pet peeves is to remember to think, make parts, not graphs. A lot of folks get into this technology of data acquisition. They say, oh, wow, look at I made a great curve. That's a great decoupled three curve. And they say, well, yeah, right, but is it going to work for the long run? And this is the next point I like to make. John mentioned the rheology curve. Everybody does rheology curves. I talk to people and they say, setting up this control strategy, how did you set your fill speed? Everybody want Anybody want to answer that? I use the rheology curve, right? And then they, uh, so there's a rheology curve. Anybody not know what a rheology curve is? Here, I could do a quick. It's essentially filling faster and faster and faster. Takes less and less energy or work. It takes more pressure, but it's over a short time, so it takes less work, lower viscosity material. So to set my fill speed from the rheology curve, the general rule is kind of this technique. Well, I use the flat area of the curve, or I use the knee of the curve, or I use the least pressure curve, and I pick the low point where the pressure, peak pressure was the lowest. Does any of that make sense for setting speeds? off a rheology curve and my answer is don't just use the rheology curve think well it helps you understand that the low shear area is very unstable little tiny changes in speed and so on create great changes in viscosity and large changes inside the cavity we know that so we don't want to run at that level so somebody will say well I think I'll pick the least pressure point it seems like a good place to run but there are other considerations on how slow you want to go. Um, the slower you go, the larger pressure gradient across the part. Molecular distribution. You get heavy weight at the packed area at the where it's and lower lower weight at the other end. And orientation may be an issue. You might need orientation in a living hinge or something like that, and you can't go slow unless you if you want all those molecules to be lined up in a row. 
Also, with these thin wall parts, the real eye opener is there's a there's like a uh, sound barrier that can't be or a light barrier that can't be broken. And if you go any slower than that, you're never going to finish that part. You may fill it, but it'll be full, it'll be sunk. The dimensions won't be right. You're out of time. It's frozen. So there's a limit to your speed for filling and packing that you have to complete the part before it's frozen. So all of that together leaves you with a speed limit on the low end that you don't want to go below. Top end of your rheology curve. Everybody hears RJG say fill as fast as possible. So they're going to draw the line right there and say, I'm going to go that fast. That's really cool. I get it, you know, really fast cycle times and get my material in there. But they forget to think about other things. We always say consistent with part quality. This is small text here, but we got impact resistance, chemical resistance, adhesion, venting, all these other things. Well, fix the venting, but all the other things that go on. Um, there's, there's uh, like Delrin, the folks from Delrin were explaining the proper linear laydown of material on the surface of the wall to get the right impact resistance that you want. So there's a maximum speed. You just can't go faster than that. More speed requires more pressure. So you might have had a great trial press that produced, uh, I had to do these in uh, metric, but you know, produced 30,000 PSI of pressure, but you got to run it in a production press that does not. So now you've got a speed limit there. Also, when you inject really fast, you create a lot of stored energy that can create overshoot of pressure in your parts. So you might have to slow down to prevent that from happening. All that being said, you also have the possibility of getting a different material required with a higher viscosity requiring more energy and running out of pressure so when you're all said and done you have a speed limit on the top end somewhere here considering all those pieces and that becomes your process window for for fill and pack speed you have to finish your part and so I'll put my little red X there and set that up I'll choose my transfer strategy based on um, thickness of the part, the type of material, and that's the essence of how to pick a decent control strategy that will respond well to viscosity changes over time. Just a couple other things. You can, you can see the running out of time when the slope of your cavity pressure curve and your injection pressure curve deviate from each other. If they're all moving along together in parallel, the wall's not freezing yet. If they're starting to diverge like that, the wall of the part is freezing and you're gonna, all you're gonna do is cram more material into the runner and the gate area and nothing's gonna happen down at the end of the cavity. Um, so don't exceed the machine's clamp and injection pressure. And then a slow speed reduces pressure and stored energy in the cavity, but like I say, in a thin wall part, you run out of time.